So I want to start by acknowledging that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So today uh, we have uh, a session um, with Peter Wing and Claire Week, and they're going to talk to us about a trip that they took, a rather extended trip, primarily to Morocco, but to a number of other places I think they may include in this trip. And uh, I just mentioned before they start their talk that this is the last talk of the academic year, and we will start back again in September. I'll mention it again at the end. So I'm going to ask Peter to share his screen. And while Peter is doing that, I would like to ask all the people on the session to please turn off your microphone so we don't get extraneous noise. I'll try to turn yours, yours off if you forget, but I would prefer to listen to Peter and Claire talk rather than turning microphones off. Now mute yourselves, please. Not Peter. Clear. Thanks for that reminder, Paul. Okay. We'll go to full screen. <clears throat> you should now have full screen. Now we have full screen, yes. Yeah. And you can introduce yourselves and then carry on with your presentation, please. Well, seeing as Claire Weeks comes first, I'll let Claire introduce <laughs> herself first. Um, I am a relatively new mer uh, member of the Ameritai. Um, I'm a retired assistant professor from the PM&R group at uh, GF Strong. Um, and uh, Peter and I have been doing photo and traveling stuff together for, for quite a long time now. And I'm uh, from orthopedics and from spine. So let's go on as, as to how we got into this, because... Um, as, as Paul says, this was part of an extended trip. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing here. Or maybe I can't. It will gradually go away. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Thanks. Um, this, this was a, a, a long trip that we had planned for some time. And as Paul says, we could talk at length about the other components, but we're going to focus on the largely on the Moroccan component today. So this was a trip that we took last year um, in about February or so, and we'll, we'll, we'll go into how this, this came about. Um, we have, I suppose, for the last few years, perhaps as have many people, been lo looking at how we travel and, and when we travel. And I had not seen my family in the United Kingdom since well before COVID. And we... We're not quite sure when we should go, but we thought it would be nice to tie it into something else when an invitation came from some friends. These were friends who you'll see in a bit, who um, had, we had cycled with before, and they were setting up a bike trip in Morocco, and would we be interested? And it didn't take us very long to think about that. Claire had been to Morocco many years ago, and, and I had never really visited Morocco. Um, so we said yes and, and started our plan. But now we wrapped it in with other things. We're getting older and don't like to fly very long distances, so we decided to break our trip from Vancouver to um, Casablanca, as, as we flew to, by stopping over in Montreal and having an overnight. And that would let us rest up a bit and, and minimize the time change. As it happens, um, we have family down in Vermont, and so Claire's cousin Ed and family came up to visit us in Montreal. So the 24-hour stop over there was, well, was well worth it. And then we flew to Morocco and we thought, well, we're going from there to the United Kingdom, um, but we've not been to Portugal before. And why don't we go to Portugal and spend a little time there? So that had another 10 days. And then we went up to visit family and flew back from France. Well, there are some logistical implications to that. Um, basically, if we had made two trips out of that to visit my family and then to the bike trip, that would have been about 5.4 tons of carbon dioxide emission. And by doing it as a combined trip, it was it was half that. And of course, if it's half the carbon dioxide emission, it's also conveniently half the cost. So that worked out really well for us this time. And we were able to make everything work. We had to stop and think about where Morocco is. We were thinking it was pretty close to the equator. Well, it's not far in comparison to us, but Morocco is, is really just at the top left-hand corner of Africa there. And the um, Tropic of Cancer is is a bit to the south and the equator quite well to the south of that so it's not quite as tropical as you might think 
our time in Morocco was, was broken up into um, several phases. The bike trip itself was the intrepid bike trip that you see at the bottom there, which is about a two week trip. But we decided that we'd like to get there a couple of days ahead, or actually more than that. We, we wanted two days to fight off the, the jet lag, first of all. And then we would go up to Marrakesh and have a couple of nights just exploring Marrakesh before going on a hike. And after that, back to Marrakesh and then joined the bike group. So we don't see the numbers, unfortunately. Yeah, so, look that. Mm -hmm. so we, we flew into Casablanca and, and then we took the train. We didn't drive. We took the train to Marrakesh because it's there. Um, and then we went around the corner and got a bus to Essoera and before returning to Marrakesh. Claire. Well, this is uh, this is our transfer as far as as we were. Uh, so in doing our research before we I left, I should say that the last leg was almost the most fun part when we were dropped off at the outskirts of Essaouira, and this chap came up and said he'd take us to where we were going, and he wheeled our suitcase through the streets, and it was just as well we did go with him for the three bucks or whatever it was, because we couldn't have found it without. We've never <laughs> found it, right? So, in doing our research about where to stay in as we were in Marrakesh and so forth before our other trip started. We learned about the riads, uh, which are basically uh, bed and breakfasts, and they're all over the country. Usually, they they are not uh, chains of of any sort. It's individual owners renting out a, a room in their house. And this was the couple from whom we rented um, our space in in Essaouira. Lovely rooftop garden, as you can see, right on the waterfront. And uh, this was a, the dining room, which we shared with the few other guests there and the wonderful breakfast that we got from them each day. So Essaouira is right on, on the port. It's a big fishing port, um, lovely old town. And they had a number of these rather large fishing boats and a number of very small ones as well. And it, it seemed to us like a very busy fishing port. When, when we were there, we watched the, your, the slide on the right there is one of the boats that had just come into the harbor and uh, they were unloading fish. You can see you can see the trays of the of the fish. Um, they looked like small fish, sardines or, or something like that. And they were being unloaded uh, rapidly and being transferred into trucks for transfer elsewhere. But when we looked into it later, it turns out that the, the fishery there, as in many other parts of the, the world, um, is, is running short of fish. And in fact, the, the fishermen of Essaouira keep moving south trying to get more fish. And that has generated some issues with the, the country to their south, uh, Algeria. But it was a fascinating place. We must have spent four or five hours there. The, the ships come in, not before dawn. They came in about eight o'clock and we watched the, them being unloaded. We watched the nets being repaired and a, a, a number of the local people shopping. Essaouira also has its own little Medina and Souk um, where they make and sell all sorts of things. Absolutely gorgeous looking and tasting veggies. And it's also a big social center to the people there. This is a place where they were making a, a, a lot of things made out of carved wood. And it was nice to see it being made there and know it wasn't being made elsewhere and just imported for the purpose of sales. I have no idea where these things were made, but there, there was just an absolute plethora of jewelry and, and so-called antiques and rugs that to be purchased there. Wonderful textiles, wonderful beads. We we found a, a lovely little vegetarian restaurant. We're we are, we're largely vegetarian. We're flexitarian vegetarians. Um, we found a, a perfect vegetarian restaurant there. This is a tower of of eggplant that we had on a couple of occasions. And I'm rather fond of cats, and I'm also rather fond of of doors. So you'll see a a lot of pictures of cats doors and and, and quite a few of bicycles. Some of them with cats and in front of doors. We go too fast because okay. the cats are hiding. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the last cat blends into the wall very, very well. But they, they were just gorgeous, very healthy looking cats. And these were some of the many absolutely fantastic doors and one bicycle. So that was it for Essaouira. After two nights there, we took the bus back up to Marrakesh. 
And we arrived there rather later in the day in a taxi and took us to the the edge of the Medina because the taxis couldn't go any further. And we then had to find our way to, to the Riyadh, um, which was rather foreboding as we went down one alley after another one with the help of Google Maps and got to the end of this alley and there was a rather inscrutable door. So we banged on it and we were admitted to this beautiful courtyard. And that's a typical thing about Riyadh. They have an open open courtyard and, and which provides ventilation for the building. So that's looking down from our level, uh, our bedroom level. And that, that's what our bedroom was like. We always had to re remind ourselves to take a photograph of the bedroom before we started unpacking, at which point it was really not going to be of interest to anybody else. Um, we were about 10 minutes walk from the uh, am I, um, the Fnar, the Jama Fnar, Jama El Fnar, which is the, the big square in the center of, of Marrakesh. And it's it's just humming at, at night, all sorts of things happening. And the bright lights in the, in the, in the far left are all um, food stalls and it's a great place to go and eat. And the people are busking around. It's probably a really good place for pickpockets who are particularly careful. Um, this fellow with a banjo looks as if he can come from the southwest of the US, but um, he was playing with a, with a group um, and we did get a little video of them, but it didn't come out very well. Um, rightly, rightfully, they suggested that we might contribute to their refreshment for the evening, which we did quite moderately, but the music was, was great fun. Um, it's very easy to get lost in the Medina, in the souk. Um, although you will see Westerners, um, you'll see more people who are not. This man impressed us particularly because he was being so kind to his donkey. He was going around scratching it and, and so on. He was quite charming with it. This is in a, in a square, so that's why it looks so open. And Claire, of course, had found another little kitten hiding somewhere there. Um, as you move away from the square, then things get a little bit quieter. This was down an alleyway to one of the museums that we, we, we visited. And um, we see donkeys everywhere and bicycles and cars. And some of them will drive down through the, the, the narrow alleyways. Things are to be carried everywhere. Basically, the, the alley is, is a part of the living space for the people who have stores down there, so they're always very crowded. And you'll see a couple of scooters going down there, and you would hear the scooters coming. It was very important not to change direction suddenly, or you might have your toes run over. Um, Claire latched onto this system of fondukes that they have. Some of them have been sort of upscale, converted into restaurants and so forth, but others are still what, what you see here. They're, they're workshops with all sorts of things going on. They've been that way probably for two or 300 years. This one has some leather work going on upstairs. They were the sites of the old caravanserai in, in the days of the Silk Road. And we don't know exactly what he was going to stick this leather to, but he was working hard at it. And, and just down the alley, there were other leather items being made and sold. And then walking down the alley, all sorts of things going on. I think you caught this chap's eye, Claire. Yes, briefly. Weaving. Shoes being made, sandals being made. You can see the lasts of all the shoes in the back yeah. there. And I don't know what was being made here. I think it was a belt. Maybe. That's a, it's a belt. belt. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Weaving, so. when, when Claire noticed the, the adoption or adaptation of the bicycle wheel into, into a, a weaving device. And although there's, there's an awful lot of bling that you can buy, this one chap seemed to have some really, really nice antique jewellery of various kinds. And no, we didn't buy the, the wonderful piece of amber that he wanted us to get. But you can see that uh, bracelet on Claire's arm that we, we did buy there. Do you want to say anything about that? It came from the Sahara, I think. It's from, it's from the Sahara, yes. uh, I think from Tuareg, but it, the, made by Tuaregs. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be my birthday while we were there. So this was my birthday present. And then lots more doors, various stages of openness. So after our introduction to Marrakesh, we um, headed off on our, our Atlas site. This was something that we had arranged on, on our own. Um, it, it was quite a bit of trouble to, to find the kind of thing that we wanted, but we found uh, somebody who was willing to guide us for a, a custom-made tour to take us, just the two of us, for as long as we wanted, for as high as we wanted, for as fast as we, or slow as we wanted. 
Um, and it was in this area where Man now the Tukal is the highest mountain in uh, in Morocco. And our hike took us in, in that general area. We did not climb the mountain itself. So we were picked up by the, the, the tour guide in Marrakesh. And this was our first sight of the Atlas Mountains. And we couldn't believe that we were still seeing snow. It was the beginning of March. Um, and we thought we were closer to the equator than we found out we were. We, were. we weren't even all that close to the Tropic of Cancer, but it, it was still surprising to see all that snow. Um, this is a, a map of the trek that we did. So we started, you want to show where, where Imlil is? We started in a little the village of Imlil and um, followed the, the first day we followed this orange track. The second day, the green track, third day, the red track, the fourth day, this purple loop. And we did, um, what was it, roughly about 10, 10 kilometers, kilometers a day, mm -hmm. and the altitude was about 3,000? About 2,000 meters in the valleys, and then we went up to about 2,500. There was no no altitude <clears throat> problem, but we were a, a little bit high. I was very slow at first. I was glad we were doing it. So this is Imlil. This is the little town that we that we started our hike in. You can see the uh, the um, minaret for the mosque, of which every every little town had at least one, of course. This was this is our our team. This is our guide on the right and our transportation fellow with all the food and so forth for the for the five days that we were out. This is the town again that we started. The the, this, the school kids had painted the rocks that color, which we thought was great. Cool. The, the the inside of this jeep was a little bit more um, conventional looking. It was actually very very nice. It does look a bit of a jigsaw puzzle there. This was was the guy heading out with um, with food for our our lunch time. So by the time we had, were ready to stop for lunch, lunch was already sitting and waiting for us, which was quite lovely. This is typical of uh, the the things that we saw on the walk. There were villages in every little valley. And they were often surrounded by the, the fields that the people in that village would farm. All of the bare trees here are walnut trees. They were not yet in bloom, unfortunately. We gathered that about a month after we were there. They would have had beautiful blossoms and, and then lovely fruits. But lots of walnuts, which they, is used for food and, and also for export. I think this is you. Okay, there's an aqueduct you can see on the left. Quite often, the, the, the pathways wander along these aqueducts, which of course nourished everything in the valley below. So there was quite a, a good system of aqueducts there. And absolutely beautiful going going up here in, into what is really an alpine region. And these are the villages that we were passing through. Um, we don't know what happened to these villages in the in the earthquake that came later last year, but we were sure that some of these buildings would have would have come out. This was the area where the with the center yeah. of the earthquake. Well, the center was probably another couple of valleys to the west, but these would undoubtedly have had significant shaking. So we were getting close to the snow line here. And this was about as close as we got. And some people, some people, some people, some people were going on up to Tukal, which is another couple of thousand meters higher, but we were not up to that. Well, and, the place uh, where we turned back, people were, were carrying their skis and we were going to be going up further, but we thought better of it. But we did reach the snow line. But this chap had set up a stand for making cups of tea and orange juice and so on. And this wasn't actually our donkey, but it was another mule waiting there. And there, that's, again, one of our lunch stops. And then this particular day, we actually were going to this refuge and we had lunch outside there because we were going on a bit higher in the afternoon. And lunch... So this, is our, mm -hmm. this is our generic talk about lunch. It is. Um, so this lunch was typically a, a mixture of things in what was called a Moroccan salad. And often enough, they would open a can of tuna and, and tuck it in. It was really very nourishing and, and very welcome. 
we had nothing to do but sit and admire the food. So close up photographs and <laughs> pictures from different angles and a cup of tea to follow. And of course, more doors, although these were a lot more rustic than the ones we'd seen in Marrakesh and Esauera. If you look at the roof style, and um, the roofs were made of, of boughs covered with um, fabric and then and then mud, basically. So no, no strength and ha had to be maintained reasonably well. This was the, the last night on the hike. This was actually the town of, of Mohammed, um, our guide. And we stayed in the place at the top of the village on the right. Um, and we actually were introduced to the hammam, the steam bath there. Of course, we couldn't take photographs in there. We couldn't go in together. You had you had a woman who slapped you around a bit. Oh, she definitely did. I'm surprised they didn't come out with bruises. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we had time to to sneeze, um, Mohammed had changed into his more usual garb and was showing us his family plot. And, you know, people there control the, the flow of irrigation water to their own trees, which I think they just change around every couple of hours during the, during the day. He clearly was well respected. He stopped and talked to everybody and, and just watching the way that he was putting his hand on this older chap's um, shoulder was, was very touching. Do you want to pick up here, Claire, because you'd found this wonderful place? Well, we thought we would deserve a, a nicer place to stay after our five days on, on the hills. And so um, we found this lovely little guest house in the Uruga Valley. It was, it was a bit of a drive from the end of our hike, but uh, they arranged it for us. And it, it was just a, a lovely place run by a, a woman, a, a, a Dutch woman, actually, who'd been living in, in um, Marrakesh for a very long time. And in addition to running the guest house, uh, in which she she uh, hired only local people as cooks and um, waiters and so forth. And she she really did her best to to keep people employed there. And she also ran a, a shop where she sold uh, textiles of various sorts that you can see here. This was our room. It, it was the most charming place to stay, especially after staying in the the, the places that we'd been staying on the high, comfortable as they were. This was the view. We had our own little terrace, and this was the view of another village from, from our terrace. Well, we haven't said much about tea. Mint tea was ubiquitous there, and um, I don't think we had the picture of mint that we were going no, through. No, mint was for sale everywhere. Absolutely mm -hmm. everywhere, and, and you could smell it as you walked through the markets. So, so this was mint tea, and these are some of the fabrics that she had for sale. So now we're on to Intrepid. Intrepid is the, the outfit that um, does um, tracks and tours around the world, but they're a particularly big player in, in Morocco. And the people that we went with had negotiated a, a package with them, and, and we basically went with that. So that's the generic stuff, and this is a particular private um, proposal they put forward to us, and um, with some minor modifications, which we had accepted. This was a group, if you were, I think we presented on this about three or four years ago because we had cycled in Vietnam and Cambodia um, with, with this group. Um, and most of this group were with us again this time. Um, so I'm a little older than I was then. Um, can we see Debbie and Steve? And there's Steve. There's Steve Maloon. And Debbie's here somewhere. There's Debbie. And so they had arranged it and they had decided to invite some of the younger members of their family. So we had quite a, a diverse age mix this time. And here we are on the second day of our tour at the junction between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Um, and you'll see some young people here who we knew were going to be very much faster. And so rather than relying on regular bicycles, we decided to rent e-bikes. Basically, everybody there was younger than us. They, Actually, no, I, I should admit that. Yeah, I think the, I was the, next, the next youngest group were um, in about 70. So a good 10 years younger than And then us. another group in their 50s and 60s, most yeah, of whom were And a few in their 30s. Yeah. And that's why we decided it was probably okay to, to rent e-bikes. This, we, we were certainly were not the only yeah. ones who rented the e-bike. As, as it happened, this was the beginning of Ramadan. <clears throat> and Faisal and Abdul um, would fast every day from before dawn to after dusk, at which point they would ravenously fall on their breakfast. And they d decided at the end of the two weeks that they were not going to do a tour over Ramadan again. Right? Um, although 
there is um, a, a way by which you can say it's critical. For example, I think the bus driver was encouraged to to drink fluids. They abstained from fluids through the day as well, yeah, yeah. and they were hot, dry days, so it's, it was quite an, an onus for them. Uh, so this is the youngest group. We were on the train traveling between Marrakesh and, and um, Casablanca and then Tangiers, and this is how they were passing the time, so a bit more vigorous than we were. Um, Lily is in her 60s um, and is still very vigorous and at this point was riding a regular bike. Um, Slowly. And in here, um, it's a bit of a mixture because these are energetic cyclists. There's Lily again. And this is Claire um, on an e-bike and keeping up with the others. And there am I struggling up the hill further back. And this was roughly the, 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 the course that we took. So rather than cycling the whole way, we would bicycle a while we actually finished up taking train all the way to Tangier with a break here and then we would cycle and ride intermittently here often riding for two three four hours a day maybe riding across lunch and then going on by bus to the next but place between 30 say. and 80 clicks a day yeah um which was plenty yeah um this is one of the hotels we didn't stay in. and then we'll go to the ones we did this if, if I'm sure if you go to Mor Morocco, you would want to stay in the, the Moumain Hotel. And it was, I think, about 500 US dollars and up a night. And of course, it's right next to one of the most historic minarets in town and has wonderful gardens with flowers and so forth. Um, well, we didn't stay there. Um, but when we went to Chef Chauvin, which is an interesting hotel, and you'll see that in a bit, this was a sort of two star hotel we stayed at. And they were very, very adequate and very good value. A very comfortable lounge when we arrived. And this is another hotel we stayed in um, much further south and later in the trip. Um, it looks a bit um, a bit spartan yeah. and, and arid all around it, um, but most welcoming inside, lovely lights and, and um, decor. And this was one of the, these are jeets and refuge now, the simplest type of accommodation we had. This was one um, on the hike. And as you can see, although they're fairly plain outside, inside they, they really are very nice bunk beds in this one and, and sort of dormitory accommodation. We were the only ones. This one also calls itself a, a, a gite, but was much grander, much grander building and quite beautiful inside. And these places usually run 40, 50, 60 Canadian dollars a night if you're arranging it yourself. And this, of course, was all included in, in our package deal. In this particular place, we got to meet some of the, the local kids. And once Claire showed them her, her iPhone, and I'm not sure what you were doing, taking photographs of them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it was it was a very welcoming thing. And then we've mentioned Riyadh, so we stayed in Riyadh on, on some parts of the trip as well. And then the, I won't say the lowest form, but the simplest form of accommodation was glamping in these tents down on the edge of the Sahara. So th that's that was giving you sort of a, an idea generically of the kinds of accommodations we had. This is give you an idea of the kinds of breakfasts that we had. They were always quite substantial, um, often included an omelet of some sort and and fresh, usually fresh uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. Um, and often lots, of, lots of fresh orange juice. Lots of delicious yeah. orange juice, mm -hmm. wonderful coffee, very, very filthy, just what you would really need for um, for a day's cycling. And then you know, Peter did lunches. Um, the, the yeah, way. lunches we sort of covered, and, and and dinner we just go through the sorts of things we saw. This was in the in the square in Marrakesh. Little skewers and yeah. uh, veggies and so forth. And this was a bit grander, rather rather nice looking salad, fruit salad. Oh, very tasty! This is a traditional dish called the Bastilla. I think I think originally it it had um, um, pigeon meat inside. Now it tends to have um, chicken. It's a flaky pastry with uh, cinnamon and um, powdered sugar on it. A surprisingly delicious mix. And we had these the ubiquitous tagines. So this is three of them being prepared for one of our dinners. We had them for many lunches and many dinners. Probably healthy and, and a bit on the bland side. And after a while, we'd seen rather a lot of tagines. One of the women in our group said that she had had it up to the eyeballs with tagines and she went out and bought something in a grocery store for dinner instead but they were very tasty very good um as, as claire said the we were there fairly early so that actually even the apple trees were not in bloom except in the one sheltered place um, below the the guest house when the apple blossoms were just coming out um but we didn't see a lot of flowers they were, they were kind of patchy um and these are some of the animals we would meet the from more cuddly to less cuddly 
And so these are some of the kids which are already bouncing around the place. Uh, a few sheep were grazing at higher altitudes, as you see from the trees there. Camels, you wouldn't describe as cuddly, nor the monkeys that we saw there. And storks are everywhere, up minarets and on power poles and you know, nesting vigorously. Cats, need we say more? Cats everywhere. Beautiful, lovely, cuddly cats. And this is what it would look like when we were riding. Um, we would ride for a while, then we would pull in and might have a refreshment break. Um, if we'd finished our ride for the day, then we might pile everything onto the onto the support van and we would climb into the bus and go on to the next town. So this is the kind of thing we would see. Um, further south, it was more open and we'd get a bit dry. So again, we'd just pull off the road and uh, just enjoy the sunshine and, and some refreshment. But the stops were always timely. It, it, yeah. We never got to the point where we were gasping for something to drink before they had stopped. We had two guides, a bus driver and a mechanic. The mechanic drove the van. The bus driver had to cut off the air conditioning when we were going up steep hills because the bus was getting on its last legs, I think. But um, it worked apart from that. On along the Mediterranean coast, we, we went along one day and then sort of curved south. And this was the rolling road. And you can imagine that we were happy when we got here that we had our e-bikes. And by the time we got to the top, we caught up with the young people again. Um, that is where they have all the beachfront um, paradises that people like to go to. Not exactly our taste, but um, you can see they get lots of sun and sand there. If that's, that's what you enjoy. Um, as we got further south, we got into this, this gently rolling countryside um, and the roads were really very pleasant. I can't, it calls this a steep hill, but it, it, it wasn't an uncomfortable hill at all. Um, even in Morocco, they greenwash their oil industry, um, but we were we were going going green. I think this is one of the hills we were able to set personal best for downhill speed records because there wasn't any traffic and we got up to about 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour. Now, Paul, let me know if you're not um, getting this video coming through. This was um, what they call the little Switzerland of Morocco because it's higher altitude and quite moderate and really it was lovely to ride through the trees. This um, friend Steve um, has osteoarthritis in his left knee here so he was going on a manual bike to to um, do a video Steve. I have to prove I can do it. <laughs> and he has since had an operation on his left knee through this. This is my coming by Claire. Cabin. You're on video. Smile. So she's on knee bike. And it's about keeping up with the next row in front of us, one of the younger generation. And we're overtaking Noam. Here you are, Noam Smile. So when we got down to the Middle Alps um, or the Middle Atlas, it was, low, it was higher altitude than we had been. I think it was around 1500 meters here, but not as high as the High Al Atlas. Gorgeous open valleys like this, just just beautiful. And and the tour had found really good roads for us. The road yeah. surface it was as was fantastic for cycling. Yeah. And then this is further south again as we're getting closer to the Sahara. I was having to um, hold my iPhone while I was bicycling, so uh, it's a little jiggly time. And even though you see that truck, we actually had very little traffic on the roads yeah. where we were cycling. And here you can see some of the, the um, villages that we were passing, built just above the, the more fertile ground below where they could grow everything they needed to be. And, and they were made of the local stone, so they blended in with the, the environment. Your bride is way up there, isn't she? Yes, yeah, she is. She's quite long ahead. And we were starting to get into these fortresses, um, a lot of them abandoned. Um, and as they built them here, the towers didn't tend to be built exactly vertical, but to have that slight curve inwards to the top. Not so clearly seen on this one as some of the, the older ones. This is where the a river was passing through some of the, the uh, a ridge of the um, High Atlas Mountains. It's very beautiful, but as you can see, the water level is quite low. Is it still mid-Atlas? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I stand corrected. These are some of the sites that we, we saw yeah. as we were yeah. either either cycling or biking through. The downhills were great. Yeah. 
but let's try and just a little because you can see how absolutely beautiful the country was. We were riding for I think about 15, 20 kilometers. We passed a, a little village every every kilometer or two to we start going over the pass. It was a beautiful sight. I have a bad habit of whistling when I'm concentrating on something, which unfortunately can happen. And this is the first of the towns we'll feature, this Chef Chow and Claire. Yes, so this is the, the blue city, they call it. <clears throat> you can see how many of, of the houses have been blue washed. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is a the lovely eccentric little hotel that we stayed in. So that this was the sort of the entryway. But we had the most remarkable rooms. The, this was our bedroom. Um, <laughs> we couldn't stop giggling at the all the paperwork everywhere. And this is only part of the room. There is a room to the side. And th this is the, this is the couple who, who had arranged everything. So they got the they got the super sized bedroom. But the ceiling was painted, the walls were painted, the, the headstead was uh, painted. We arrived in the evening, and this is uh, Chifelin at night. And again, the, the, the doors, the gates, the windows, the walls, there's so much blue everywhere and just lo lovely shades of blue. And a little bit of red. This is a bakery, the communal bakery. They don't, the, most of the homes, the traditional homes don't have a bakery in them. And they bake communally. This this was built um, in the 1100s, and uh, it still used as a communal bakery twice a week. More food. And this, we, that particular restaurant had a lovely outlook. They've had a fantastic. This was the restaurant where we had all this. More beautiful doors. More lovely cats. Even the steps were blue. And onward to Fez. This is Fez. Um, had you been to Fez before? You've been yes. to Fez before, and, and, and of course I hadn't. The the old town, the Medina, is, is down in this part here. It's sort of the top right. So that's the interesting part of town. We spent two nights in Chef Chown and two nights here. And this really captures the spirit of, of Fez. I think the women are all off working hard somewhere, probably. There we had a, a professional guide, and she was a historian and really was, was a terrific, terrific guide. And they do a lot of pottery um, manufacturing there. It's all, all done by hand, uh, cranking out all the tagines and, and then decorating everything that comes out. Um, they, they make a number of, of different ceramic products, mugs here being decorated. And these are some of the finished things that they hope you'll take away with you, of course. Some of the things that were amazing were like this top one on the top right, where they have found a way of incorporating metal into the pottery and it makes for a very interesting surface but the the um, central part itself is easy to get lost in and we had to be led through here so this is one of the wider alleys and this is one of the narrower alleys here they don't have room for any of the shops but it's quite spectacular when you when you enter it and this is a fairly typical scene um, there's a you can buy camel meat on the left there and um, Beyond that, I think we see some walnuts hanging up and all sorts of things, veggies and, veggies and so forth. Wonderful produce, all beautifully fresh. Dates, of course, everywhere. Um, we were told this was agave silk and we were all very impressed and so forth. And looking deeper into it, um, it's probably best to keep calling it agave silk, but it's probably something a little bit simpler. But it is beautiful and, and they do a lot of weavings and, and um, fabrics. And these are the famous tanneries. Um, and before you go in, they give you some mint to put in your nostrils so that you won't suffer too much from the rather foul smell. And the guys are wading around in these pools and dipping them into all the different colors. And it is, it is quite astonishing. You see all the hides at the back hanging out to dry. And out of this, they turn the most beautiful leather work, which you can buy afterwards if you wish. And um, some of it's quite gorgeous. And by the time it gets to this stage, it doesn't smell anymore. Um, some of the places where we would stop at the roadside and perhaps go for a walk through, um, seeing the, the crops growing um, beneath the trees often where the, the valleys are irrigated from the, the rivers. And 
so this is our first site of the desert. We knew we were going to be spending, was it two nights in the desert? Or one. Mm -hmm. um, so this is our first site of the dunes of the Sahara. <laughs> we're trying for a camel ride, and, and this camel is not folded in half. It's just trying to stand up and, and protest at the same time. Fortunately, um, Joe is holding onto the handlebars very well, because otherwise he would have been tossed over its nose. But once we got going, it was really quite lovely. So that's us going up in the... To watch the sunset. These were the local guys. We, we had to, to leave our bikes uh, down below and, and climb up to the tops of the dunes, and these guys met us there. Of course, they were all well-equipped with their cell phones, and they, they told us how to take the really extraordinary photos like this. So the guy on the left is showing us how to do it, instructing us on how to, to take cool photos, including <laughs> there were a bunch of very silly ones. <clears throat> And then in the evening, we... The music is very enthusiastic, but it's a bit hard to, to have dinner, too. <laughs> yes. And then as we traveled on, it was still a very, very dry country through here. This we passed, and it's actually a concentrated solar array, um, which has been built over about the last decade and turns out, um, I think, 580 megawatts. It's, it's, it's enormous. the largest in the world. Largest in the world. And it has all these uh, several thousand uh, mirrors, each the size of a tennis court, and they track the sun and focus it on the top of this tower. And it's molten salt that is then stored to generate electricity later so that it has about seven or eight hours storage capacity overnight. So it's really quite something. And I think one of these has recently been opened in the American Southwest. We were taken into a, a carpet factory, but by that stage, we're a little bit um, tired, I think. I don't I think everybody think. looks quite jaded and nobody bought anything. But this was a, a, a wonderful um, casar, it's called. It's an old it's fortress, fortress village, yeah. partly inhabited, partly not inhabited. Um, and partly new and partly old. So the, the stuff with the, with the, the more um, e um, careful incising is, is relatively new yeah. and the older stuff is a bit more decayed. It, it's used for film sets and so forth, as well as um, as in dwellings for a number of local people. Here we're looking over some of the, the more ramshackle or deteriorated parts of the buildings to the, to the newer parts. Well, that sort of brings us towards the end of our, our travel in, in Morocco. And it was so there we, we headed back to Marrakesh where we had a couple of nights and then. Uh, yeah. And, and then we went off to, to, to Portugal and we might have to do a, a thing on Portugal, Portugal. A, 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 another time. Um, but, but not long after we were there in September, in, in basically. September they had this, this earthquake. And um, well, having been in the area, we wondered if we could get some some money through to help. <clears throat> but for some reason, the uh, Moroccan government was not accepting money from any charity in Canada. And so we ended up uh, putting a, a certain amount of money in through the woman who, uh, the Dutch woman who ran the little hotel that we had stayed in. But we really haven't seen very much or heard very much about the deaths or the degree of destruction of the buildings. You would also be interested in this, Paul, perhaps, because um, we thought that there must be the number of spinal cord injuries and we were able to track down the one spinal cord injury centre, which is in um, which is in Fez. They don't seem to have one in the Marrakesh area. And we tried reaching out through our through our international organisation. Um, but at that time, they hadn't made any arrangements. And I think they, they have a number of countries that they have um, good relationships with. Um, France, I think, is among them, Spain at times, um, Israel at times. Um, and they were not wanting to accept help from others. They did have a fairly effective military. They have a rather ineffective king who at that time was um, in his favorite pad in Paris. And, and um, He does mixed quite, martial arts. That's his main interest in life. And his chief advisor is a German mixed martial arts enthusiast. So the politics are not bad, but not, not great. So that sort of brings us to the end of our presentation. That was quite some severe damage from the earthquake. This was our group. So we were going to talk a little bit about lessons learned. And um, 
uh, not a lot, but one of the things that we did in chatting with each other was compare the ease of signing up to a to a prearranged trip like this, which was, was absolutely wonderful, with the with the dip, difficulty and complications of trying to set up your own. So the the all of the independent time that we had in Marrakesh and um, was we set up by ourselves. The trip to Essaouira we did by ourselves. The hiking trip we did by ourselves. The trip to Portugal we did by ourselves. And I did a fair bit of that. And at the end of it, I, I said to Peter, I don't care what a travel agent charges you. It's worth it because it really was a very, very demanding. On the other hand, we got exactly what we wanted. It was really, you know, custom made to our desires. This trip was wonderful because there were no there was nobody on the trip we didn't know. We liked everybody. We were all a bunch of friends. We we were very well suited in many ways, in spite of our difference in age and therefore difference in fitness. We really got on really well, but that was one of the, the lessons to be learned. And the other lesson, of, of, of course, was just that the um, we, f we felt good about the fact that we had eliminated one other long trip in, a, in an airplane and, um, and had gotten some financial compensation because of that. Any other lessons? I think that's it. <laughs> that was it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm Claire. I'm just going to change view I view to gallery view so I can see more people. Um, I must say that uh, having done a bit of a trip, an organized tour that we organized ourselves, as you know, uh, you were very brave to do what you did, in my opinion. I, we, we wouldn't have been uh, able to do what you did. Not a, not talking about the biking part of it, but coming to all uh, the towns and finding your little Riyadh on your own and so on. It's uh, interesting that you were able to do that. And yeah, I, uh, the, one of the things I want to ask you, you showed all that beautiful food with all the vegetables and salads and so on. Did you eat all of those fresh salads? We Raw did. Salads. We, um, we're, we're, we spend a fair bit of time in Nepal, as some of you may know, and um, so we, I think we've probably captured the world's market on, on uh, Pepto-Bismol. Uh, we, we, we did take a fair bit of that prophylactically. Especially but in the early days of a trip like that. Anything that's cooked, like the um, tagines, we thought, we didn't think twice about, of course, but the, but the salads, with, and what they call a salad has a certain amount of chopped fresh veggies, but the rest of it is rice or cooked noodles. Um, and we felt we felt pretty good about them. We stuck. We watched it, and even at altitude, we watched them boiling stuff for a long time. We felt pretty uh, pretty safe, and and neither of us came down with anything. I suppose that's the the proof. More so, more so, I think felt more comfortable there than we have in Nepal, probably. Yes. We avoided some of those fresh uh, fruit and fresh uh, salads and so on. I see Susan has your, her hand up. Yes, thank you for a fabulous presentation. Um, you've just made me add Morocco to my list of places to go. Uh, and I was interested in the, the Blue Village. Is there a story behind that in terms of what the blue signifies or or why they decided to do that? You may remember more, Paul. I know it was done, it, it was decided by the village as a whole to do this, to make a theme of the village. It doesn't have religious significance, although the color blue uh, and may do, but that had nothing to do with it. Do you remember, Paul? Did you read anything else about why they chose? No, but I noticed that many of the villages in Morocco have their own theme, their own color theme. Exactly. Like Tangier was was a wine red. Right. It, and a similar approach is white and so on. They, they all seem to have uh, their, their specific color that they try to keep uh, all the buildings looking somewhat similar. Uh, one of the things I might comment about, uh, Claire showed cats. And I don't know if you like dogs, but you hardly see any dogs there. We didn't. We didn't and, see a lot. Our guides say that um, cats are loved by the Moroccans, dogs are not. Mm -hmm. And in part, the dogs are considered to be like a devil. And if you would wash your hands, which you do before meal, before praying, and a dog passes you, you have to wash again. Oh, I think that. So I was originally, I, I said, 
there are so many cats around and they're well fed because they do look after them. They but do. No, you don't see many dogs. Come, coming back to the blue question, um, I, I did glance at it briefly while Claire was out earlier, and it, it, I think there are several explanations for it. One was that um, Morocco was quite welcoming to, to a number of Jews um, and refused to collaborate with, with Hitler during the war. Quite a number had moved to, to Morocco, who were living there in the, in the 1930s, and that blue was apparently a color used by some of their trades. But how that mm. led to it, I'd have to go back. It's certainly not what our guides told us. No, but I mean, a lot of things are stories passed, passed down that may or may not have uh, yeah. any relevance to the truth. Any, any other questions or has anyone else been to Morocco to comment on it? Well, well as you know, we, we were there just uh, this year and we were there during Ramadan. And if maybe you could comment about uh, whether you think being there during Ramadan is a good thing for a tourist or not so good a thing for a tourist. We were not sure about that. We were afraid that things might be universally closed. But I think the most tourist... Um, dependent work it, it continues. Um, yeah, I think in the souks there were there were a lot of doors that were closed. Mm -hmm. I think it was quieter than it might have been. Um, and certainly our our guide said never again. They do not want to go cycling during Ramadan. But in general, it didn't affect the the trip. I mean, mm -hmm. the trains ran, the buses ran. The you know you could you could stay in Riyadh's and hotels. The the restaurants were open. So I don't think, for us, we didn't really feel anything. Uh, before I come to you, Don, I, I, I just comment that I found that uh, compared to when I'd been in Morocco before, uh, the souks, particularly in the streets, were generally empty. Like, I couldn't believe in Marrakesh. I could take photographs with absolutely no people on a street, on a road within the souk itself. Whereas before you pushing, pushing people around, there were lots and lots of people worried about pickpockets all the time. There were very few people uh, in the middle of the day. And even at night when they opened up, it wasn't as busy as it tended to be. You know, yeah, I agree. And the big square was much was, quieter was so. a lot quieter than <laughs> I would ever, but I was there 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. you know, the, the Mamadan may have had nothing to do with it. Don, you've got a question. Don Blake yeah, I uh, have a question. I should have inter uh, asked you about this question one earlier on, but in one of your earliest slides, I think it was in Marrakesh, you showed a picture. It looked like to be a night market. We had uh, lit up stalls surrounding this open square. And it looked like people were standing around with fishing poles. What were they What were they doing? <laughs> they, they were fishing for the objects that were in the center of the square. Oh, I see. It's like a carnival sort like of thing. Like a carnival thing. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I can't see everybody, so if you are not acknowledged by me, just start talking. Ken, I can see your hand. And can you hear me? I can hear you also. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, would you, uh, fascinating talk, Claire and Peter. Really enjoyed it. Uh, would you define Medina and Souk? Well, my understanding is the Medina is the the, the um, commercial center of the town, and the souk is the market. The oh. Medina is often walled in. Yes, the part so of the walled city. Inside. And, the, and of course, they expand outside that, and they, they refer to the center. And as you say, the souk is where you do your shopping. Yeah. And would you agree, Paul? Yes, I think, I think all of these towns have a central area that is the old part of the town, where the streets are relatively narrow, they're up, up from the medieval time or earlier, and they're part of a wall city, they're within the walls of the city, often guarded by a castle they call a kasba, and um, often it's associated or next door to where the leader, whoever was in charge, would live in this castle that would protect the, the Medina. And then the newer part of the uh, things are, tend to be outside this uh, Medina. Um, the souk are just like its name for market. But quite often the markets within the Medina, the roads are narrow and there'll be shops all along the road. Um, 
Marrakesh seems to have one of the big, and the feds have big, big marketplaces that you get lost in. So a huge loop, it's good to get some kind of guidance to get from one part of that to the X. If not, you get sort of lost as to where you might be located. And if you want to find, find a supermarket, it will be outside the wall, right. in the outer parts of town, and, and they're, they're quite um, conventional. So somehow the... The outside of Somehow. the Let's go ahead, Claire. The outside, I think only once we stayed well out of uh, the Medina, and that could be anywhere. It could be Burnaby, you know. So, so um, it, it was nice to, to stay within the the city center if if you could or close to it. Can you somehow, somehow your discussion took me back to those wonderful books of Beau Geste and Beau somebody else, can't remember the other one, the, the uh, French foreign legionnaires and, and the uh, the Moors and that kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah. You know, the, the architecture in the far south where they have these very gently rounding buildings, I, for some reason I, I had a memory of that from the, those old stories. And, uh, and when we finally, I kept waiting to see it, you know, and when we finally did, I thought, ah, this is the real desert Morocco. Don? Oh, no, it's, it's not. Sorry, it's just my cursor. Oh, okay. It's Peter's cursor. Does anybody else have any comments or um, thoughts? I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Let's see. Nothing in the chat, no. I know I would definitely not be as brave in sampling the foods. I'd be panicked by the risks of GI, GI problems, but you, you, you don't have those concerns. I think that when you go with an organized trip, as we did, I think they do a lot of research on, on how safe the food is in the place you're eating. And, and much of the trip was that. I mean, we did some on our own. In the hike, same thing, you know, we, we, although it was complicated to find the, the fellows that we went with, it was a commercial group. And I think they're very aware of how, how foreigners' stomachs handle their food. So I think they do their best to make sure that things are well cooked and well cleaned. Intrepid is based in Australia, I think, and they also have an office in Toronto. So they're, they're a reasonable sized company, although their groups are small and, and, and pleasant. Well, I am a little bit less uh, courageous than Peter and Claire have been. Um, like you, Ken, I, uh, we stayed in very, it was an organized tour. It was a, it was a private tour, but organized by an agency. Uh, we stayed in nice places, Riyadh, just like Peter and Claire did. Uh, we were told that the food should be safe to eat. But we still avoided, and we were taking prophylactic medication that Peter Dodek, I see he's on the thing, had recommended some kind of uh, um, probiotic, can't remember the name of it. We were taking that, but even so, uh, my feeling was I was there only for two weeks. If I got sick in the middle of the trip for a couple of days, it would ruin those couple of days. I was just not prepared to do that. I said I could deal without fresh salads in particular. Because yeah. you have to wash that properly. And they say, yeah, they wash it with uh, uh, sterilized water and so on. But do you really know that they have done it properly? I don't know. So we avoided that. Water. We, we do treat our we own water. We treat our own water. And we, we always take aqua tabs and um, we, we always have some that is sterilized ready and we do our teeth in that and so on. Yeah, well, the teeth is not a problem. But the problem is that do you take the water to the restaurant and then try to wash your lettuce? And no, yeah. we, we don't go that we don't go that far, but we probably won't eat lettuce either. <laughs> yeah, because but they did have fresh tomatoes. Fresh tomatoes you know, yeah, like when we go to Nepal, we don't eat things that you can't peel. Right. And in Morocco, we, we were much less cautious, and so there were fresh tomatoes, fresh cucumbers with the skin on, um, and we did. They have a lot of corn. I think that comes out of a can. <laughs> Anyway, maybe we were just lucky, but um, we we didn't have any trouble. There was one other problem that we faced over this last week, actually, having agreed a couple of months ago to do this particular presentation. We didn't realize until last week just how many photographs we brought back. 
that we hadn't processed. Yeah. Peter had processed his. Some, some of them. But I had not done mine. And how many did we start out with? Well, 1,300 of yours. <laughs> <laughs> so we, it's been a busy and fun week going through the, the Many papers. of the photographs were taken on, on iPhones, and a few were taken on a, on a small Sony. <laughs> so ha ha having uh, been to Morocco uh, for a couple of weeks uh, over Ramadan, um, I, for those who have not been there, it's a fascinating place, as you've seen from Peter and Claire's uh, photographs. It's very photogenic. The people are very pleasant. And it's relatively cheap as uh, tours go to go there. And even having someone organize a tour relatively upscale, there were four of us. We had a Mercedes uh, van, a driver with us all the time. Um, and he drove us everywhere we wanted to go. He was even available to take us to a restaurant for dinner, come back to pick us up. And he was uh, Arab, Moroccan, and he was observing Ramadan. Yeah, he was. There are Arabs and there are Berbers and so on, but he was Arab. In, in any case, he, he would uh, fast for the whole day. At lunch, he would take us to a restaurant. While we were eating, he would go and pray and have a nap. And then in the evening, at break the fast time, um, we would always make sure that he was free to go break the fast. Then after he broke the fast, he would take us out to a restaurant for dinner if we were going out and not eating at our area. And then we would call him and say we were finished. And he would have finished his evening prayers after his break the fast, and he would pick us up again. And even with that kind of thing, it was really a relatively economical kind of trip to do and very comfortable. So I, I would heartily recommend it as a, a place to go. I happen to be Jewish. I would advise before I went, uh, because of what was going on in the world, this is a Arab country, Muslim country, be, be careful. I had absolutely no impact there. I didn't recognize any anti-Semitism from, from where I was located. And so yeah, I, I, I'm Jewish too. And actually we somehow managed to not include uh, some th photographs we took of an, a, a, a beautiful ancient synagogue in er Essaouira. And every, it, everywhere that we went, if anything, they were really intent on telling us how how good they were to the Jewish people. That, it, as Peter was saying before, that at the, at the time of the Second World War, um, Hitler tried to convince them to take some of his Jews before he decided to kill them, and and they refused. They and they, and they he wanted them to send their Jews to, to yeah. Germany. That was he, he wanted and, the and, names and addresses. And, and he would. They that was that was the. The, the king previous to this one, it was this guy's Muhammad the sixth, and it was Muhammad the fifth who apparently refused to to do that. And it, they, but they told us that story several times, so they were they were very intent on us knowing that they were not like other Muslim countries. Yeah, and and this was before the troubles over over in, in, in Israel. Israel now. And I think that the Israelis were among the first to, to be there to help after the earthquake. Yes, With respect to the earthquake, uh, you know, it, it's obviously difficult going to a place after something like this. But at the same time, it's part of their economy and they need to keep it up as much as they can. So they're certainly open to people coming. We heard that there wasn't that much damage in the Marrakesh mm -hmm. souk which is one of the things that you really want to spend time on because it's just so exotic. There, there, there was not much damage there at all. That's what, that's what we heard. We were there after the earthquake and we saw some places that were damaged out in the mountains, but not in Marrakesh itself. It was okay. We, we, we thought that we were being told uh, about all the Jewish things because they thought we might be Jewish. But it seems like they tell, tell all tourists, whether you're Jewish or not, about their relationship yeah. with the Yeah, the Inquisition. Because at one time, the Muslims and the Jews together were kicked out of Spain, and they came to Morocco together. Exactly. You know, basically persecuted people coming out of Spain and Portugal. So they bonded together in many ways during the Inquisition.
maybe that was the background. Here. But still, I felt very comfortable there. I see Peter Donek has indicated in the chat, if you're interested, the name of the uh, uh, probiotic that he recommends, which is Floristor or Saccharomyces boulardii. Okay. Okay. There. okay. Can you get that an over-the-counter? Yeah. It's over-the-counter. I, I just got mine at London Branch. And it certainly is easier to, to, to handle than taking so much uh, Pepto-Bismol. You just take one a day. <laughs> Peter showed himself. He's not in. But even with that, Peter, I still was hesitant to go and take the fresh, uh, beautiful looking fresh uh, salads. Strawberries. strawberries in particular. I figured, I don't know how you could wash the strawberries so carefully because they're corrugated. So I was a little hesitant despite taking the, your prophylactic probiotic. Well, and interestingly, we didn't go through any of the places where this stuff was being harvested. We could see the green areas alongside rivers, yeah. which were juxtaposed to the orange, dry desert stuff. But we really didn't pass through any of the areas where we could see how it was being irrigated, how it was being harvested. So that's a bit of a mystery. Yeah, a lot of the vegetables are grown further north where, where it's greener and moister. Well, well, we saw lots of beautiful vegetables in many of the different places, and we visited some vegetable gardens in the desert. And ah. they had a very uh, interesting way of taking the water in little, little channels, and then they would, uh, people would have their individual plots, and they would have a tape mud and block off a certain channel and direct it to a different uh, the water in a certain area for a specific amount of time, then they block that off. So I guess everybody had their own arrangement knowing what time they would be able to get water. And, and their their uh, own personal land is very well demarked. That they, they know what's theirs and, and what isn't. Yeah. We saw that too. They they had the metal sheets that they would just drop down to, to block the, the, the flow in one direction and, and divert it off to another direction. Anyhow, a very interesting place to visit. Yeah. So Peter and Claire, thank you so much for a really uh, interesting, well-illustrated talk. Uh, obviously, the excited interest in some people who maybe have never been there, never thought of going there. So thank you again, and a wonderful end to the academic uh, year. And we hope to uh, see you back here in uh, September. Happy summer, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Have a great summer. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.